Hello everyone and welcome today today's uh, Crown Council webinar entitled You're Liable the biggest mistakes in hygiene that could come back to bite you this is Steve Anderson joined today by uh, uh, Shauna Ackerman who's going to be our webinar leader today uh, again just a couple of reminders uh, you're in listen only mode we can hear you cannot hear uh, excuse me we cannot hear you but you can hear us you're encouraged uh, to submit questions at any time during the webinar in the control panel uh, in the questions section. We will take those questions near the end of the hour as they were submitted, so feel free to do that at any time. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me introduce you to Shauna Ackerman. Shauna is known as the MBA dentist. Uh, she brings a unique blend of clinical expertise and business acumen to every practice that she works with. She is one of our great team at the Total Patient Service Institute, one of our very qualified practice advisors. Uh, her dental experience includes uh, dental assisting in the U.S. Navy, uh, schedule coordinating in private practice, and eventually becoming a dental hygienist. She was born and raised in Los Angeles and received her MBA from Southern Illinois University and also a Bachelor of Science in Neuropsychology from the University of Washington and her Associate Science degree in Dental Hygiene from Lake Washington Institute. Her experience and studies in science and business have given her the ability to provide a higher level of care to patients and wisdom to coach teams hands-on. Doctors and teams say that Shauna creates an improved morale in the practice while increasing productivity and case acceptance and she makes things more productive and more fun at the same time because she says it's only work if it's not fun. So with that, uh, Shauna, welcome and uh, thanks for being uh, our webinar leader today for You're Liable, the Biggest Mistakes in Hygiene that Could Come Back to Bite You. Shauna? Well, thank you so much, Steve. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, how being a dental hygienist, we're a licensed professionals, comes with accountability and how that accountability can lead to liabilities for acts we commit or often omit in the course of doing our jobs. I do want to point out that a lot of the topics I'm going to talk about today we already know. We, we probably already do quite a bit of it. So it won't be a news flash. Some things may be new but you want to use this information today to look at what you are doing. And in the wise words of Steve Anderson, he says that knowing is not doing. Doing is doing. And sometimes we have a difficulty in remembering what we know and actually applying it on a on a day-to-day -day basis in our practice of hygiene. So today I'm going to start out with some of the specific actions that we take to lead us into a path of possible liabilities. It's going to include some of the misconceptions many of us have about doing a profi, when there should be blood in the treatment room, what mathematical ratio we should look at to see if we're getting down a path for potential liability issues, and how to solve the number one dilemma hygienists say, I have too much to do in the appointed time. Finally, towards the end, I'm going to wrap up with some examples of the top ten reasons dental hygienists are held liable. And so let's start with the profi. As, as we know, we see 8, 10, 12 patients a day, depending on your schedule. And we have to maintain the highest professional standard of care when treating all of our patients and at all times. Those standards of care must always be met. They must be exceeded at every instance. Hey, Shauna. Yes. Um, we need to see your slide change. It's not moving. Okay. It's not moving. Just in case everyone was wondering. Is it moving now? Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Okay. There we go. All righty. So, to meet those standards of care, we're going to start looking at what a profi really is. Let's define it. According to the American Academy of uh, Den the, uh, Dental Hygiene Association and the ADA, a profi involves maintaining gingival health of a patient that is healthy. They can have plaque and they can have calculus, supracalculus, but there's no bleeding involved. 
For insurance coding purposes, the CDT defines a prophy as the removal of plaque and calculus and stain from the tooth structure. It's intended to control local irritational factors. Therefore, by these definitions, a prophy is meant to control the, the super stuff, the debris sitting along the gum line, plaque, calculus, a little bit of stain. So if we're doing a prophy, it should include scaling above the gums, on the facial surfaces, the lingual surfaces, in between the gums, and removing any debris. You'll polish. Sometimes you'll choose to use an abrasive agent to remove some stain. You'll definitely floss them. I know hygienists, we love to floss. And we'll apply a fluoride treatment as, as recommended. So that's a prophy. In contrast to this, let's look at the definition of what a periodontal maintenance appointment would be. So back to those CDT codes, how insurance discusses it and the ADA looks at it, perio maintenance. There's a long definition. I would invite you to refer back to your manual. But in that definition, it states following perio therapy, it includes the removal of bacterial plaque and calculus from supra and subgingival regions. So by definition, the periodontal maintenance or even your active periotherapy includes debriding pockets with bleeding present greater than three millimeters, people with bone loss, people with recession. That's where the perio maintenance is. So if we look at the contrast between a prophy and a perio maintenance, we start to reflect and say, so how low can you really go if we're doing a D1110, which is the prophy? So, Shauna, if I can interject here, I to state the obvious, uh, because there might be a lot of people going, yeah, yeah, we know all this. Here's here's the the contrast to this is I think everybody knows what the definition is. The challenge that we see is that we see a lot of subgingival activity going on in the treatment room that is coded as an 1110, uh, and that so again. Nothing you don't already know in terms of content and definition, but the real question is what's going on in the treatment room <clears throat> and how it's really coded, that's the real issue here. And what the real question is, is we go in and out of practices all over the country. Uh, we see uh, in, in many cases an inconsistency with what the code definition is versus what's actually going on in hygiene. That's right. So hygienists, we now we know. I, I've read it to you. You learned it in school. We know the rules. But how hard is it to just stay away and not put that curette down underneath the gums? What what's it hurting? Well, it's not hurting anything. You're doing fantastic active scaling and root planing, debridement, perio maintenances on all of your patients. But we're not matching the act of what we're doing in the clinical treatment room to what we're coding in billing as a prophy. And that's where we're we're not we're not having the conversation with the patients. We're missing the mark. We're if bone loss is present, we have to talk to our patients about it. When recession is present and bloody prophies are occurring, we have to talk to our patients about it. A little later on in this webinar we're going to talk about those bloody prophies and, and some of the things that we're, we're doing in addition to it and why we're, we may be doing it. But if bone loss is present, if recession is present, if bleeding is present, it's it's result of a bacterial infection. You're no longer doing a prophy. You f we find ourselves in these situations where it would be prudent to have the conversation with the patient regarding where they are in the disease process and what what we're very concerned about and how we're going to recommend treatment to move them towards health. And that's where we're becoming liable. We're going too low, if you will, on a prophy. You're going down under the gums because, well, we want to do a good job. We do want to take care of our patients. And ironically, when they leave, their bleeding stops when we get all done because we did. We went under the gum line. We got out all the bacteria and plaque. And we, what we forget to do is have the conversation with the patient and tell them what's wrong. We just go ahead and clean their teeth. But really, we're doing active therapy on somebody who is not, by definition, healthy.
Uh, Shauna, one, just one comment here that we hear a lot from patients, and, and just a question to you is, should, should a cleaning hurt? Well, Steve, why would it hurt? <laughs> <laughs> and so that, if it's all above the gum line, I mean, that's, that's one exactly. thing that we, we exactly. hear a lot from patients is, is they came in to get their teeth cleaned, and then they, you know, they say, well, it hurt. And that's because what they're getting is not technically an 1110. They're exactly. A lot more than that. And so the patient's been, well, maybe you've been a good guy or a good gal by giving them an additional service. If they don't understand it, then we're not really helping them get healthier and, and take better care of themselves. So the definition, I think this is a great topic for a team discussion with everybody on the team, is to go back and have a discussion about what technically does an 1110 consist of versus a 4910? And to what degree are you consistent with that in your coding and your treatment? That's right. So stay above the gum lines. Have your conversation with the patient. Yes, you're going to clean. A lot of, a lot of the hygienists I work with when I go out into practices say that, well, I, I can't just clean above the gum line because I'm not getting all the plaque off. This doesn't mean don't go in between the teeth. I know that papilla po pokes up there. Clean in between the teeth, everybody. But it doesn't hurt if you're giving a prophy. If the tissue is healthy, it doesn't hurt. So that segues us right into um, when should there be blood in the treatment room. I had mentioned bloody prophies earlier, but um, there shouldn't be bloody prophies. Oral surgery provides bloody situations. That's, that's normal. Dentists, if they're drilling into the tooth and go into the pulp, there'll be blood there. Periodontal surgeries, there's lots of blood there. If a patient has an active periodontal infection when you're doing a perio chart, there will be blood there. This is an image courtesy of Dr. Neighbor's team, and I believe you guys are on here, so thank you for this photo. Um, if you're doing active periotherapy or you're doing a perio chart on what would look like healthy tissue and you pull your perio probe out and it looks like this, then there's blood in the treatment room. This is not a prophy. This is when you're seeing blood because you have a patient here with a bacterial infection underneath their gums. So you want to determine what's going on in your treatment room. Protect yourselves. Inform the patients. Know what's going on. There shouldn't be blood in a hygiene treatment room unless you're doing active therapy or you're about to diagnose it. Alrighty, so how do, we, how do we look at diagnosing periodontal disease or how do we get a, a thumb on the pulse of our hygiene department? What, what are some of the things that I look at in my department to see am I doing the right thing? Are my prophy ratios correct? Am I diagnosing correctly or am I just being a good girl and helping out my patients every hour and cleaning their teeth? and giving them a prophy even though they're infected. Some of the things that you can look at are, it's, I call it the 80-20 rule. How many prophies versus peri appointments are in your practice today? How are you tracking how many cases you diagnose of periodontal disease? Really look closely everyone. What's your ratio? If it's not greater than 80% uh, like a D4910 or a 4341, 4342, which are your SRP codes, you may be liable for supervised neglect. The ideal ratio for perio in a practice would be 80-20. So according to the CDT, or the, excuse me, the CDC, almost 50% of Americans have been diagnosed with some form of periodontal disease. Now of those, 38.5% are cases of moderate or greater. Everyone, that's an AAP3 or 4. That's pretty severe periodontal disease. You have chronic bone loss at this point. Recession is present. Furcations can be present. This is a problem. So if over 50% of our population has this much disease, we've diagnosed it pretty late in the game. Furthermore, this number is on the rise. In 2006, the National Institute of Health stated that the number of cases of individuals diagnosed with periodontal disease 
is greater than 50% of what is reported. That means that this ratio, this 50% ratio that we're getting from the CDC right now, we could be off by 50%. What does that tell us? 90% of the population maybe has periodontal disease. So if we take that into consideration, if it's possible, it's probable that the American population may be approaching the 90% mark for periodontal disease, who has not been diagnosed in your practice? Bring it home to your practice. Are we underdiagnosing our patients? Are we not looking at true needs of our patients because we want to just help them out and get their teeth clean because that's what they were expecting? Steve, I know you had a story about perio disease. Yeah, so I think this is just a, a word of caution and a reminder. Uh, I was talking with a practice some time ago in a uh, wealthier demographic and we were going through hygiene numbers and their collective comment was well we don't have as much period disease in our practice because our patients are more educated uh, which I thought was an interesting conclusion and to my knowledge uh, unless somebody can shoot it to me I have never seen a study that shows a direct correlation or an inverse relationship, if you will, between education and periodontal disease. Now, granted, uh, if you're in a less educated population, you might have more of it, but, but I am not aware of anything that proves that the disease, especially what we know today about periodontal disease, that it has a bacterial origin uh, I've, I've, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that says that bacteria respects education. No, no <laughs> so, correlation there. Um, <laughs> and, and just as the same way that uh, a heart attack, uh, somebody who is uneducated or well-educated, uh, there's, there's no difference in terms of who has a heart attack, arthritis, diabetes, or a new, you know, number of other ailments. So. Uh, granted, people that are more educated might have a, a higher tendency to take better care of themselves, uh, but the disease itself crosses all socioeconomic lines, especially what we know today with its bacterial origin. Uh, it really crosses all lines. So take a real careful look at the numbers. You know, the numbers uh, tell an interesting story. What percentage of the time are you spending in hygiene? quote unquote cleaning teeth versus actually treating disease and if you're in alignment then there obviously should be a greater proportion of your time that's spent actually treating disease uh, or maintaining those that have been treated than doing a cleaning. Awesome. Now this map that you see on your screen I don't know why they're given the south Y'all down there, they're giving you a bad time. <laughs> they sh it, it doesn't really look like this. They just use it as an image, pers uh, image. but it's not the, the lower half of America is 50%. Don't worry about that. Okay, so then we, we know that hygiene, we have to look at what we're doing to make sure that we're not held liable for failing to take care of our patients correctly we have to do many things within our hour and now from what I'm saying we also now have to start having this conversation with patients about infections in their mouth about periodontal disease things like that there's a lot to do in an hour I know that I've had to do it other hygienists have to do it I hear it everywhere I go throughout the whole country so how do we solve the problem of there's too much to do in the appointed time and now we have to we have to tell our patients we're doing more than just cleaning their teeth I have to start talking to them more and I get that it is, it is difficult to do so we need to take a close look at what are we doing during our hour of hygiene I agree talking to our patients is very important in fact we spend more time with our patient than anyone else in the office so we do need to have that relationship we do need to build that rapport but while talking is great and it's very important too much of it can never be a good thing and one of the key things to remember is as animated hygienists I, I get that we are we like to talk with our hands 
it's very difficult to talk with our hands and put them in people's mouths. So while we're talking and engaging with the patient, it's important that we continue to work through the hour. That's one of the biggest recommendations I, I make to my, my um, colleagues and all in different practices. The rule I like to follow when doing hygiene, and I've, I've put this in place in practices and it seems to help keep everybody on track, is it's what I call the 20-20-20 rule. I'm sure most of you have heard about this and, and wonder, well, how do I actually do it? I will break it down for you in three sections. I want to look at the first 20 minutes, the middle 20 minutes, and then the final 20 minutes of your appointment. And then we're going to talk about where there may be some exceptions to the, this rule. In the first 20 minutes, I always start out with a relationship building conversation, an orienting comment. I let them know what's planned, what they can expect, and I ask them if they have any questions. The very next thing I do is I update their health history. Now I don't do this and I say any changes in your health. I actually have a copy of their health history and I say are you still experiencing X, Y, and Z? Are you still taking medicines A, B, and C? And I'll get into why that's so important a little bit later. But I actually go over it with them. Between the orienting comment and the update in the health history, that's three minutes. Now, three minutes doesn't seem like a lot, but I challenge you to do anything while watching a timer and time three minutes. Three minutes is quite a bit of time. Following my orienting comment and my update of health history, I take their blood pressure. Now, I always allow a full minute to do this because sometimes the blood pressure cuff errors or sometimes you need to switch wrists for whatever reason. So I'm at, I'm at four minutes. Following my blood pressure update, I like to take all necessary x-rays. So m some offices do a pano and four bite wings, some offices do four bite wings and three PAs, some offices just do do four PAs or excuse me four bite wings. So that can take anywhere between five and seven minutes on the higher end. I always like to allot for additional time everywhere just because each practice has their own standard protocols. Following that we're all done. We've gathered the data, the external out of out of the mouth data that we need to get before we actually proceed into the, the appointment where the patient leans back. I've been given permission to proceed by my patient with the orienting comment, let them know where we're going. I lean them back. I do my cursory extraoral and intraoral exam. I do my diagnodent readings on every patient and then I do an oral cancer screening. My oral cancer screening takes two minutes. I want you to go back and time how long it takes you to do an oral cancer screening. I give extra time because oral cancer is one of the highest reasons we get in trouble, hygienists. We forget to do the oral cancer screening and then we get held liable for failure to acknowledge it and address it with the patient when they get diagnosed elsewhere. After I do my oral cancer screening, I do my perio charting, and then I disclose their mouth. So let's see how that breaks down in time. The relationship building, I give it about a minute. The update health history, a good two minutes. Again, I told you I let myself have a minute for blood pressure in case I get errors. X-rays, on the higher end, I do five to seven minutes. Now hygienists, I know, dental assistants, they say, oh, I can do it in, I can do it in three minutes. I give us five to seven minutes. My EOIO exam, again, about two minutes. My diagnodent, very easy. I run it across all the teeth. They're dry. It's a minute. I said two minutes for oral cancer screening to make sure we have time to do a very thorough and complete job. And then my perio chart. I give perio charting three minutes. Not because we have to go extremely slow reading out the numbers, but I do a very thorough perio chart. I recommend that we perio chart all six points, but I also document recession because I want to see if there's a change. I document bleeding points, I document any pus, and I use the word pus with my patients, not suppuration. I use the word pus. 
and then I have them rinse with a disclosing solution so we can look at where their plaque is on their mouth um, as a as an oral hygiene tool. So I do all of that in the first 20 minutes. You gather all the data to prepare you for the next step of your appointment, which is your cleaning section. And if you're if you spend 20 minutes on a patient who is where they're supposed to be in health, be it a profi or be it a maintenance phase, that's about 15 to 17 minutes to do your profi. I scale the full mouth using my Cavitron. I also do fine refinement with my curettes and sickles. And then I polish for about two to three minutes. And I want to say with polishing, remember polishing is not the cleaning. Only the patient believes that the clean is the cleaning. In hygiene school around the country, they're teaching polishing should take no more than three minutes. And that's that's a long time. And then I floss and then I take any IO photos for doctor when she may want to come into the room and have, you know, if there's a cracked amalgam I saw or a, a, a hole or a lesion or something in the mouth, I use that last few moments in my middle 20 to take some photos to pull up for the patient when doctor's going to come in and speak to them and I'm going to come and speak to them. So how did I break down that 20 minutes? I said 15, 17 minutes for the profi or perio maintenance and that is my scaling my use of my Cavitron, my polishing, maybe three minutes. Flossing, it never takes more than two minutes. I've been timing flossing for the last two weeks in preparation for this webinar, and it's I'm hard-pressed to take a full two minutes to floss, and that's doing everything we love to talk about, hygienists. What do we like to say? Floss with the C-shape. Get below the gum. So I've been doing that, and I'm hard-pressed to be able to get it all the way to two minutes. So I give you some wiggle room there. And then on the intraoral camera, that takes anywhere from one to three minutes, uh, depending on how many photos you want to take. And if you have to, if you're using a, a USB IO camera, or if you're using a camera where you have to plug the, the card in. So there's a little wiggle room there. But if you really think about it, if a patient is healthy, it doesn't take more than 15 minutes to do the physical profi. And if they're on perio maintenance, it's just that. It's a maintenance. All we should be doing is debridement of plaque, because people do get plaque, and any supra flexicalculus here and there. If it's a perio maintenance, they're in every three, four months. So you 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 do take off the debris. Don't get me wrong. I we don't want to ever leave a bunch of stuff on people's teeth. But if they're in a maintenance phase or they're a healthy patient, there shouldn't be so much that we're spending 45 minutes quote unquote doing the cleaning part of the of the visit so that's your that's your middle 20 it's the meat and potatoes of what what we do and then in the final part of the the appointment the last 20 minutes I spend one minute doing a relationship link to to my doctor my doctor's a female so I, I mean I call it her I let her know what what we've talked about, where we're at, what I've seen, any concerns the patient may have. This is very, very brief. Doctor spends no more than five minutes in my operatory doing an exam. And then as she's doing her exam with me, she's telling me what she's finding if there's an additional treatment need and I'm entering it in the computer or those of you who are uh, still in your charts, I, I have my, my form and I, I'm writing treatment down right as she's speaking so her exam time for us for a hygienist it's not a waste of oh my gosh we got five minutes that are holding me back five minutes use that time input the treatment that doctor is talking about or that you have recommended or where you're going to go spend some time doing patient education use your visual aids that you have the best visual aid you can use is to show bacteria on a microscope, to show intraoral photos of the patient's own mouth. It's a lot easier to relate to when they're looking at something that's theirs, that they can understand. The word periodontal disease, gum disease, things like that, those are just abstract terms to people who aren't in our dental community. So use your, use your visual aids, use things that you have. You have tools and resources at your disposal in your practice. 
Um, I give them their hygiene instructions. I give them their take-home kit, which can be toothbrush, toothpaste, dental floss. Um, those of my patients who are in active therapy, I give them their bottle of Therasol. I remind them about their use of the water pick. We, I answer any questions. I ask them if they have any concerns, anything that we haven't addressed, help them move forward in their visit and towards health. All, all that goes on when I'm handing them their packet. And then they're off. I go and give them the relationship link to whomever checks them out. It could be your scheduling coordinator, your finance coordinator, whomever walks them out. I walk them out, I do a link, I tell them what we did, what we're, where we're going, any questions the patient may have had, as in financial questions. I make sure the patient doesn't have any more questions about what is necessary to move forward, say it be a filling or whatnot, have I answered all of the clinical questions so you're ready to appoint with whomever's there. And then I run back to my room and I spend the next five to seven minutes breaking down my room, sterilizing it and getting set up for the next patient. So all of that, I mean if you really set a timer you're going to see it only takes about 15 to 20 minutes max by that 60 minute mark you're ready to seat the patient. If any one of these areas are taking more than 20 minutes, I would look at your timer and see where the breakdown is. Now, if your cleaning of their teeth is taking more than 20 minutes, I would strongly recommend you reevaluate whether this is really a prophy or if it's really or if it's a perio maintenance rather than needing to be an active therapy appointment. Okay, Steve, did you want to add anything there? No, I think we're good. Keep on rolling. Okay. Alrighty. So, I want to I want to kind of wrap this up with some stories and some examples for you. I don't want to bog you down and worry, make you worry, but I want to give you something to think about so when you go back into your operatories and your offices today, you can really start evaluating what am I doing? what do I already know how to do and am I actually doing those things and in doing so am I following the highest clinical standard of care at all times and remember part of the highest clinical standard of care is informing our patients so there are top there are like a top 10 list out there. Um, many of the malpractice companies have them where hygienists are being held liable in conjunction with the dentist for different acts committed in the in the dental in the dental office. I'm not going to go through all ten of them, but I'm going to hit on about six of the the chronic ones and these are in the this is the top six of the ten. The number one reason dental hygienists are named as co-defendants in liability cases are failure to update medical history. High quality chart records are the most important aspect of preventing 80% of lawsuits from ever reaching the courts. The medical history update is of primary importance. Now according to the ADA, a failure to update the medical health history is among the top five record keeping areas committed in dentistry or errors committed in dentistry. So I have a story for you. All the stories I'm going to share with you in the next five or ten minutes are actual lawsuits. Um, we had a female patient named the dentist and the dental hygienist in a lawsuit for loss of her unborn child in 2006 and it was due to nitrous exposure. She claimed that the hygienist failed to update the records indicating her possible pregnancy and in failing to ask the patient if there were any changes in her health, the patient forgot to tell the hygienist she was pregnant. The hygienist administered nitrous for the entire appointment and the patient later miscarried the child. The patient filed the lawsuit against the hygienist and the dentist for loss of child due to nitrous. Now the dentist and hygienist were not found guilty or at fault for the loss of child, however they were fined and found liable for failure to update the medical history. So your action item here, always, always, always update your medical history at every visit. Even if you saw the patient a week ago for a new patient examination and you have a brand new health history, they were diagnosed with whatever and they come back 
after the weekend, Monday morning, to get their treatment going. Once you give them your orienting comment and you get them ready to go, the very next thing you need to do is say, Mr. Patient, are there any changes in your medical history? Have you changed any medications you're on? And show them what they said. You have their health history. Make sure it's updated. Don't get caught in a liability because we didn't ask the simple question, are there any changes? Okay, the second one, which is the is the number one reason hygienists and dentists are facing lawsuits right now is failure to detect oral cancer. It is the primary reason we're getting ourselves into trouble. Hygienists, by the virtue of our hygiene education, we are trained to spot abnormalities in the mouth. Too many of us operate in this turn and burn mode where we're omitting the most important aspect of patient visit, which is that oral cancer screening. Take the time to look. Um, the lawsuit that I want to talk about is a 70-year-old woman. She, she lives in, in a, a town right up the street from me in Everett, Washington. She was seeing her hygienist every four months. The hygienist had repeatedly noted a growing mass on this woman's lower lip. She had records of intraoral photos. She had photos of where she put the perio probe across the lesion measuring the size of it at every visit. She has documented scanned in copies of every time she sent the patient home with a referral to the oral surgeon. She has documented copies of the patient signing a form informing the patient that she had this lesion. For three years the patient refused to go see the oral surgeon and she also refused to allow this particular general dentist to to use the laser to biopsy the lesion. Three years into this the patient was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. It had spread through her lip, into her jaw, through her tongue, and it was down and through her lymph nodes. It was all over her body. She did not survive. Her family went after the dentist and the hygienist. They were named in the suit. Now, here's I wanted to give you a positive story. That's why I chose this one. No action came of this or no consequence came of this because the hygienist had done everything correctly. She had noted in her chart the oral cancer screening, the use of the Velscope, the photos, everything she had there. It was done and she protected our, herself. The patient's refusal became just that. It was the patient's refusal. We had, or She had done everything to protect that practice and herself from getting in trouble. So the action item here, do your oral cancer screening. You need to include a visual inspection. You can use a VisLite or a Velscope or whatever oral cancer screening tool you have, but make sure you're doing a visual inspection. You want to feel around the head and neck area. You want to look and feel in the oral cavity. Palpate the area. Make sure there's no funny bumps, lumps, or lesions. Okay. Do that. Okay, another story I have for you is uh, the failure to detect periodontal disease. Hygienists, we are named as the primary people in the lawsuits for failure to diagnose periodontal disease. The dentist gets named as a co defendant in most of the cases that I could find. Hygienists, we get named as the number one. We are failing to, co to diagnose periodontal disease. We have all the tools necessary. We perio chart. We do a tissue assessment. We take x-rays. The current of standard of care is a full mouth six point perio chart report every year. I would go back and look at your records. Are we diagnosing periodontal disease? Are we charting correctly? Are we doing perio charts at least on an annual basis? I won't, at, during this webinar, I'm not going to make a recommendation of how often to chart your perio maintenances and things like that, but I, but the, the rules say, the clinical standard of care states that you need to do it at least once a year and it needs to be charted. How often are you conducting these exams out loud to your patients so they can hear where they're at? Furthermore, failure to inform the patient of the periodontal status what their treatments are, if in the event their charting has changed, what our recommendations would be, and failure to tell them 
the risks or complications that could occur to the periodontia if they don't follow through with the treatment can result in a liability for us, the hygienist. So the lawsuit that I'm pulling, I pulled up was uh, a patient who had continued to receive prophies every six months for 15 years. Her first tooth she lost was number 10. She lost both of her upper right premolars following that, and then she lost number 18. Um, and she had class 2 mobility in most of her posterior teeth. And she had class 3 mobility on her lower anterior teeth within the canines. So she was informed by, um, they didn't say who informed her of what periodontal disease was, but she was informed about it, found out about this thing called gum disease. For all I know, it could have been Dr. Oz's show. And the dentist and hygienist were subsequently sued for failure to diagnose, and they were found liable for her loss of teeth. And they, this, this particular practice had, had quite a bit of trouble because they had no documented perio charting in this patient's record. They had no treatment plan that was signed or, or acknowledged by the patient that anything was wrong. For all that woman knew for 15 years that everything was okay, be it her teeth were moving, she didn't know because the doctor and the hygienist, the people that she trusted for her oral care, they didn't, they didn't tell her. Hygienists, if you do anything, discuss the perio status with all patients at every visit. Conduct your full perio charting every year and make sure to take the necessary x-rays because that can show a progression in bone loss and it's something that the patients can actually see on the screen and understand. Nowadays with technology, everybody understands an x-ray. You just have to show them what our x-rays show. Okay, the last one I want to do is tell you about the lawsuit of failure to protect your patient's privacy and telling confidential information to other patients. This is a biggie hygienist. We love to talk. We love to share stories about our friends and our husbands and our sisters and everybody. We like to talk to our patients. We've been seeing them for 15 years. We know them. We're catching up. Be very careful. Here's this. This is the lawsuit during the treatment, and I'm reading this one per, straight straight from the article. During the treatment of a long time patient, said hygienist confided in her patient about another female patient she had treated earlier in the day. The hygienist mentioned the patient's name to the afternoon patient and shared with this afternoon patient how the woman from the morning had been diagnosed with cancer. She was undergoing a very difficult divorce. She was just devastated. To the horror of the hygienist, the patient she was talking to in the afternoon was the sister-in-law of the woman from the morning. Hygienists don't share confidential information with other patients about diseases, about examples, anything like that. You can use diagnosing examples to patients, but don't say names, don't say when, don't say who. Just share the clinical data. Protect yourself. No gossip in the hygiene room. Okay, I think we're gonna we should add that to our 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 office code of conduct. Alrighty. So as you can see, more and more often dental hygienists are being named in lawsuits. While the dentist malpractice insurance is there, it may not always cover us. If in the event a dentist and hygienist are named in a lawsuit together, there's also the probability that the dentist can be dropped if they weren't involved, i.e. Um, a hygienist causing damage to the patient during a routine visit. The hygienist may not be covered if the doctor is dropped off the claim. And in other instances, if a dentist's liability insurance limits are met, the hygienist may be responsible for additional expenses and then they'll come after us in a civil suit. Um, it is critical that we do everything that is reasonable to maintain the highest clinical standard of care to limit any liability. It's okay to make mistakes, but if we document it, acknowledge it, and tell the patient the truth, it's very hard to, to cause us harm in terms of liability. We must always strive to maintain a practice that meets or exceeds our standard of care, and then failure to be aware or failure to be current on the clinical standards of care, that's not going to hold up in court. It's not going to protect you. We won't be able to say, well, I just didn't know it was the standard of care to do a perio chart every year. They looked healthy. It is essential that we always maintain our clinical knowledge 
to protect ourselves. Now, healthcare right now is changing. And when healthcare change has changed, we are becoming a primary care provider. Dentists are the primary care providers right now. Because of an increased pressures on doctors and other healthcare professionals to do so much in less time, patients are finding it very difficult to actually see a doctor. More often than not, patients are seeing a, a um, physician's assistants or nurse practitioners. They, what we know now is that it's evident that dentistry is the primary care provider. There is no other doctor or practitioner that patients see more often than they see their dentist. Hygienist, we see our patients sometimes every three months. No other practitioner in all of these medical roles sees their patient as much as we do. According to a study that was conducted um, by the University of Massachusetts at Boston, 82% of patients today expect their dentists to address whole health issues like blood pressure, systemic links, and the oral presentation of systemic diseases. We can smell diabetes in the mouth. You can see oral cancer in the mouth. We can detect blood pressure issues by doing consistent blood pressure readings. If you have a patient who's going good, going good, and then their blood pressure spikes, that could be a problem. We do that and we can do it as many times as quarterly. That's a big deal. Patients only get their blood pressure read once a year if they go to their doctor like they're supposed to. We can see them every three months. The only other frequency for blood pressure is if they go to their grocery market and they do the, the readings by the pharmacy if they do that. So we have become the primary care provider. Dentists and MDs, we are them now. Now, with this, it is no longer just our obligation, but it's the expectation of the patient that we will be more fully equipped to discuss and suggest to our patients situations we see. We need to share with them what we suspect is going on. With all of the evidence that we have now, and it's continuing to grow daily, based on the nature of disease, we need to talk about all of it periodontal disease included, oral cancer included. Periodontal disease specifically, what we know now about periodontal disease is changing the way we treat patients clinically. We cannot afford to continue to hide the facts from them in any aspects. So what I, what I recommend we do is call it action, hygiene. Take control of your operatories. Do the right thing take the blood pressure, do the right treatment, and if you're billing for a profi, do the profi. If you're doing a perio maintenance, make sure you're telling the patient what they're getting, or rather active therapy. Stay on top of where the science is going because it is changing rapidly with studies coming out monthly. Periodontal disease and total health are one of the things that we are seeing in every aspect of our media right now. We have to change how we treat patients and realize that patients' expectations are changing. Stay connected. If you're practicing on an island alone, you have no connection or any interaction with other hygienists in the country. You're not plugged in. You need to be more plugged in now than ever before. Go to CE courses, join peer groups, go on the Crown Council, and join the different discussions going on. Make your profile, reach out to other ones of us out there. Go to the TOPS Roundtable. I know we're having a hygiene, hygiene one in June. Steve, I know you're going to talk about that. You have multiple Crown Council resources on that Crown Council website. Subscribe to your monthly hygiene magazines. Subscribe to your journals. Read your doctor's journals. I know they get them in the mail every month. Stay connected. So I, in, I, I invite you to, to start taking a look at exactly what you're do, doing. You know, oops, you know how to do it. Now just make sure you're actually doing it. Steve?
Very good, Shauna. Uh, let me mention a couple of, of resources. Uh, one that you just mentioned and I mentioned in the announcements before the webinar, if you uh, go to crowncouncil.org, uh, any hygienist as well as any other team member can sign on and create their own profile uh, on crowncouncil.org and then join any number of discussion groups, including a hygiene group. So we'd encourage all the hygienists listening today to, to go to crowncouncil.org, create a profile, and join the hygiene discussion group. Uh, next, Sean, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, our TOPS roundtable. Uh, every six months in June and uh, this year in November, uh, we invite uh, doctors from all over the country, uh, now all over the world, uh, to come to Dallas, Texas for two days of masterminding and idea exchange. Uh, our next one will be June 13 through 15 in Dallas, Texas, and at this roundtable we'll have a separate and special roundtable session just for hygienists. So it's an opportunity as a hygienist to sit down with other hygienists around the country. We'll have two days of discussion topic, topics as well as some presentations that you can learn from, exchange ideas, and stay on top of the latest uh, techniques and latest treatments that are being used around the country. Uh, second, if you'll go to the next slide, Shauna, is uh, our No More Hygiene uh, seminar, The Secrets of Modular Periodontal Therapy with Dr. Tommy Neighbors, and the TOPS team has become uh, amazingly popular uh, as we do that ongoing. Our next program is on August 2nd through the 3rd in Dallas, Texas, and then after that in October in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, you can uh, contact Kim Maddox on the TOPS team for more information about that. Her uh, email address is kimm at nomorehygiene.com and her phone number 817-395-3910. Or you can go to nomorehygiene.com uh, for information on that course that will fundamentally change your perspective and how you view hygiene. Uh, with that, I'm going to address a number of questions that have come up during the webinar, and uh, we'll take those in order here in our last few remaining minutes. Uh, the first question has to do with clarifying the 80-20 uh, explanation, and here's what I, I just say about that, is if, if you look at and estimate what is the prevalence of periodontal, periodontal disease in the population, and if you were to say that there's at least 80% of the population that has periodontal disease, then go back uh, to your own practice numbers and see what percentage of the time or what percentage of the, of the treatment codes are actually uh, treatment related versus just uh, a, a cleaning. So in other words, if, if you're actually treating disease, then you should be spending 80% of your time doing scaling and root planning or root debridement therapy and perio maintenance and 20% of your time doing healthy mouth cleanings with the assumption that 49, once a 4910, always a 4910. So I hope that clarifies that, uh, that question. Here's the next question. Since so many dental practices are heavily dependent on complying with ground rules established by insurance companies and those companies entitle patients to one pro free every six months, how can our practices make the shift to perio maintenance coding? And moreover, how do we re-educate the insurance companies to pay for perio maintenance procedures when indicated? There was a great suggestion uh, in this area that was made during our last webinar. Uh, if you have not listened to that webinar that was done by Dr. Charles Blair, uh, entitled Coding with Confidence, if you go to the Crown Council website, crowncouncil.org, under Training Webinars, and it's webinar number 26, Coding with Confidence using the correct 2013 CD, uh, CDT codes. One of the suggestions that Dr. Blair makes in that webinar is that you always code for what you did. So if you're doing uh, four uh, perio maintenance visits, always code them a 4910, and in the narrative, uh, then just put in the narrative that in the case that uh, the 4910 is not allowed, please use the alternative 1110. I think that was pretty close to his exact words. So you, you always code for what you did, and then in the narrative suggest that if there is an alternative code for an 1110, uh, that you, you go ahead and do that. And then, of course, the patient education skills along with that uh, would, be, uh, would be appropriate. Uh, next question is, how do you go from a profi to perio 
uh, maintenance without doing root planing. So let me just clarify that. Uh, in the in the webinar, Shauna was contrasting uh, what a cleaning consists of in 1110 versus what a what perio maintenance consists of. And so uh, obviously <clears throat> you would have done perio treatment a 4341 or greater uh, before you would do a 4910. So we, we skipped that because we were talking about the contrast between what a cleaning consists of and what perio maintenance consists of. Uh, so hope that uh, clarifies that that piece of it. But naturally, you would do perio treatment before you would do perio maintenance. Uh, next question is: What if the patient refuses treatment like root planing, but just wants to continue doing prophies? Great question, and one that should be discussed as a team, and especially with the doctor in in cases like that, uh, in terms of how you handle patients. At a minimum, if you are going to continue doing uh, a cleaning then the appropriate informed consent document that the patient would sign would be very appropriate. As well as, uh, if I could suggest this, is a lot of, that, of those issues can be solved with really good verbal skills, which is one of the things that is the ongoing effort of the Total Patient Service Institute is get everybody on board with, with those verbal skills so that you can correctly convert people from a cleaning to actual treatment. Uh, next question is uh, wondering what the recommendation is when a patient refuses the recommended treatment. For example, if someone's diagnosed with peri disease and insists only on having a prophy, which we just talked about, do you still retain them as a patient with documentation that they refuse the recommended treatment or you do, do you dismiss them as a patient because they will not allow us to treat them the way you know best? Here's been my experience on this uh, and I could share several different recent experiences with this is in almost every single case, the reason a patient turns down treatment is because they don't understand what's going on. They want a cleaning for some specific reason at, that's within their perception. Uh, maybe they just want the feeling that their teeth are clean and they want to be able to run their tongue across their teeth and they feel good. Uh, but it really goes back to a fundamental principle that that is part of everything that we teach in the Crown Council and TOPS, which is be interested first and, and understand where the patient's coming from, meet them where they are, understand what they want, and more importantly, why they want it. Why is it that a, a cleaning is so important to them? There's a reason that they're asking, and until you understand their reason, then you're not really equipped to address the issues. So get on their, their side first to truly understand them and then move forward. Beyond that, then that's a judgment call. You as the professional with the license have to decide what you'll do with those patients. Uh, but clearly, if you decide to keep them, you, you want to have appropriate documentation and informed consent. Uh, next question, is there a specific formula to do when looking for your 80-20 rule? Here, here would be the suggestion is go through, take the last month, for example, and, and look at all your procedure codes that happen in hygiene and see how much time you spent. Uh, and you can just compare these two things. How many 4910s did you do compared with how many 1110s? That, that's just a simple ratio and comparison. Just compare 4910s to 1110s and see what that ratio comes out to. If 80% if of the time you're doing an 1110 and only 20% of the time you're doing a 4910, that might suggest that there hasn't been a whole lot of perio treatment that's happened in your practice if you're being consistent. Another thing that we see a lot is that you're treating, but you're still coding as an 1110. We see that a lot. Is uh, A lot of it has to do with approval addiction, which we talk about a lot in the Crown Council and TOPS is that, you know, to be a nice guy, you just code it as the 1110 because that's the course of least resistance, but that's not really what you're doing. And so good verbal skills, good presentation skills, and a good clinical protocol around those things will help overcome that. So with that, great questions, by the way. Thanks for all your, your questions and your participation today. And Shauna, thank you for your great content today and for all the great reminders. I hope that in everything that you've shared today, I know there's been uh, several things that uh, any hygienist that's been listening and watching has 
uh, learned as well as been reminded of. Again, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted at crowncouncil.org later today. We'll make the announcement to the Crown Council email network as well as the bibliography for all of today's information if you're interested in source material. Uh, as well as uh, the enrollment forms for the Hygiene Roundtable coming up in June in Dallas, as well as the No More Hygiene course coming up in August and October in Dallas and Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks again for joining us today for our webinar, More to Come. And thanks again for joining us. Hope you have a super day, and thanks for being with us for our Crown Council exclusive webinar today. Have a great thanks, day. Thanks, Steve. Bye, Thank everyone. You.